Hello, and welcome back to the fourth video in our Zero by One publishing video series. In this video, we break down the five laws of existence referenced in the first chapter of the book titled Zero. These five fundamental laws regulate what can or cannot exist, orchestrate how existence is made manifest, and determine the fate of everything that crosses the threshold. Before we break down these five fundamental laws, let's establish why laws exist in the first place and how they come to be. How and why laws exist. There are many theories surrounding the purpose and origin of laws, primarily the laws of physics. One of the key debates in science and philosophy is whether the laws of physics were present prior to Big Bang or emerged with everything else during the birth of the universe. It's the classic cause and effect conundrum. Laws emerge right along with whatever they seek to regulate, even if the law wasn't recognized until a later date. We may have just recently established a law that the speed of light is constant, but that doesn't mean that light was speeding down the cosmic highway until humans came along and put up speed limit signs. From the religion side, the Christian Bible and the Hebrew Torah offer that the very first existential law simultaneously emerged with the creation of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest, thereof thou shalt surely die. So apparently, even in a veritable paradise, there are rules that must be followed. Also, according to Old Testament scripture, before the Hebrews reached the Promised Land, the necessity for order and structure emerged. This is where Moses answered with a set of regulations called the Ten Commandments. These ten rules were legislated by the God of Abraham, handed down to Moses, and served to regulate the societal and moral behavior of the Hebrew people. Although these Ten Commandments remain unaltered and still recognized by Christians and Jews millenniums later, technology is constantly changing and evolving. This poses complex challenges to legislators and citizens governed by their laws. During the birth of the United States, a set of constitutional laws were ratified on June 21st, 1788. Two years later, the Second Amendment was ratified. Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Fast forward to present day where advancements in weapon technology challenged the relevancy of this 233-year-old amendment. Single-shot muskets, swords, and cannons have been supplanted by fully automatic firearms, F-22 Raptors, and nuclear weapons. This evolution in weaponry has led to the countless heated Second Amendment debates and constantly evolving legislation. The truth is that the more complex a society becomes, the more likely that its laws will end up in conflict with each other. The wording, scope, and impact of a law can actually divide the populace more than offering order and structure. In America, the right to control what happens inside your body conflicts with the right of a developing child to exist within you. Many laws become a battle of morality where no middle ground is offered nor taken. So why is there a need for any laws in the first place? Regardless of how things change over time, the reason why any law exists is to ensure the ongoing existence, function, and security of whatever is on the business end of the law. Laws perform several functions. Laws ensure repeatability. Newton's third law of motion states, for every action there is an opposite and equal reaction. It is arguable that this isn't really a law as much as just an accurate description of what takes place during particle interactions. The reason why we declare it a law is because there are no exceptions to the rule. Observable repeatability ensures that Newton's law will be just as applicable in the future as it has been in the past. Laws ensure reliability. One of the postulates in Einstein's theory of general relativity is the principle of constancy of the speed of light. This law states that the speed of light always remains the same in a vacuum. That means we have a reliable constant for evaluating the speed of other objects in relation to the speed of light. However, in the world of sentience, many Lamborghini owners might not feel so compelled to abide by a 65 mile an hour speed limit. Laws ensure proper function. Kepler's first law of planetary motion states that planets move in elliptical orbits with the Sun as a focus. This law of governing planetary orbits has not only demonstrated repeatability and reliability, but it also ensures that planets don't randomly crash into the stars they orbit. It's reassuring to know that our beloved planet Earth won't plummet into the Sun based on our current planetary orbit. Laws ensure safety. For the first 10 billion years of the universe, there was no such thing as safety, nor any laws available to promote safety. This is because there wasn't anything in danger nor in need of safety. Stars don't issue a press release to neighboring planets whenever they're about to go supernova, nor would any of the planets abandon their orbits even if they did. It seems that the only objects in the universe concerned about safety are sentient life forms, which just happens to be us. Yes, laws that promote safety exclusively belong to the realm of life. And whenever you're dealing with sentience, there's no shortage of opinions, which makes legislation all the more difficult. So we know about laws that regulate natural forces, laws attached to inanimate structure, and the laws that govern sentient life forms. But what about existence itself? 
Is there a set of laws that supersede all other laws found in the universe? Introducing the five laws of existence. The five laws of existence emerge simultaneously with the emergence of existence, as demonstrated in the previous video, pictured in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. In fact, everything that exists is subject to some type of law. Even chaos obeys specific logic-based law that states whatever is chaotic cannot be ordered. We find that logic plays an important role in the five laws of existence, as this only makes sense with the universe orchestrated by mathematics. So let's step through them in chronological order. First law of existence. Only that which is logically conceivable can exist. This is the primary law of existence and from which all other laws are derived. This first law is fairly straightforward. There is a mandatory requirement for everything that exists, and that is logical conceivability. Whatever attempts to move into existence must first pass the litmus test of conceivability. Now, this law doesn't mandate that whatever is logically conceivable must exist, but rather that the odds for its existence cannot be set to zero. A good way to test the validity of this law is to try to think of anything that exists that's not logically conceivable. If you think you have something, then let us know in the comments section. Second law of existence. Anything deemed logically conceivable can be brought into existence by way of an evolutionary progression of consciousness moving from simplicity to complexity as long as all other laws of existence are obeyed. Within this law, consciousness is synonymous with information. Since everything that exists is comprised of information, then as long as this information can be communicated, it can also evolve. An example would be a modern desktop computer that represents a collection of hardware and software. Software is the data, and a computer's CPU is what processes the data. Combine the two into a single function, and you have what we call consciousness at the fundamental level. Now, for the many hardcore reductionists out there screaming, Consciousness is from the brain! You're both right and wrong. You're correct that consciousness is produced by the brain, but you're incorrect to think that the same information generating and processing hasn't been going on since the beginning of existence. Brains are just a more highly evolved animated recreation of an earlier inanimate process. So whereas the first law states what can or cannot exist, the second law determines if and how the information can evolve. Third law of existence. For any comprehensible reference point to exist, a minimum of one additional reference point must exist that is equally comprehensible and able to be juxtaposed with the other. This reference point can be similar, different, or diametrically opposed, as long as it abides by all other laws of existence. So, was that a head-scratcher or what? So let's clarify. This law references a strange dichotomic template that seemingly orchestrates the cosmos. What I mean by dichotomic is that every particle that makes up the cosmos has its own antiparticle. This is required so that either particle could be rendered conceivable. Positive is mirrored with negative, black is balanced with white, and repulsion counters attraction. This isn't something that humanity came up with and then suddenly declared it a law. It's just a solid, reliable template that's been in effect since the dawn of existence. Fourth Law of Existence the existence of whatever has obeyed the first three laws of existence can only be sustained through the formation of a closed or dynamic spectrum or array that is able to evolve. Two reference points serve as the minimum requirement to form a spectrum with the fourth law establishing what type of spectrum is formed. If only two reference points are present within a spectrum and evolution is not possible, then this becomes a closed spectrum that is immediately subject to the fifth law of existence. With the first law of existence determining an applicant's candidacy for existence, the second law orchestrating the movement of the applicant into existence, and the third law mandating a corresponding reference point for each and every applicant, the fourth law of existence establishes the applicant's placement within a closed or dynamic spectrum. A closed two-point spectrum meets the minimum requirement of the fourth law of existence, but don't expect any applicants residing within one to exist for very long. Closed two-point spectrums that cannot evolve are instantly subject to the fifth law of existence, which we will discuss later in this video. The fourth law is where most of the action takes place because everything that currently exists is operating under this law. Everything is scrambling to find placement within evolvable spectrums to avoid a summary judgment issued by the fifth law of existence. A quark-antiquark -quark pair is a perfect example of a two-point closed spectrum that cannot evolve. Because a quark is logically conceivable, it fully abides by the first law of existence. The first law of existence allows a quark to exist. Since the information that makes up a quark is conceivable, and this information can be actualized into whatever the information describes, then it abides by the second law of existence. And with our quark now properly paired with its necessary antiquark, the third law of existence has been obeyed. However, since no evolution can take place between the two endpoints, 
the quark spectrum turns closed, unevolvable, and instantly subject to the fifth law of existence. The only hope for the prolonged existence of our two-point spectrum members is if they can find placement within other spectrums that remain dynamic or able to evolve. Proton-antiproton and electron-antielectron pairings are no different. They must also find placement within other dynamic spectrums in order to prolong their existence. But how do particles and antiparticles pull this off? Well, proton-antiproton pairs and electron-antielectron pairs can abandon their closed two-member spectrums and form a new evolvable spectrum called hydrogen, thus prolonging their existence. Unfortunately, hydrogen also has an antiparticle called antihydrogen, and should they end up as the only two spectrum members and no evolution is possible, then our trendy hydrogen-antihydrogen spectrum ends up no different than our lower-level quark-antiquark spectrum. Fortunately for hydrogen, it can allow one or more neutrons into its spectrum to further evolve into protium, deuterium, and tritium. In addition, both hydrogen spectrum members, hydrogen and antihydrogen, can find sustainable placement within newly emerging dynamic spectrums such as water, ammonia, hydrogen fluoride, alcohol, and carboxylic acid, all of which must also be able to evolve within their respective spectrums. Now, if you chronicle all of the spectrums that have emerged since the emergence of quark-antiquark pairs, you'd eventually end up with 8 billion individual living spectrums called humans, all running around on planet Earth. With Earth being a member of an eight-planet spectrum called the Solar System, which is a member of another dynamic spectrum called the Milky Way, which is a card-carrying member of yet another dynamic spectrum called the Universe. So if you've been following along and can recognize this observable evolutionary pattern that permeates everything that exists, then it appears that existence has been playing a 13.8 billion year long game of kick the can. But to what end? Why the struggle? Why has existence been pushing quarks into hydrogen and hydrogen into water and water into life and so on? Why not just let all the quarks and antiquarks simply annihilate each other upon their emergence and be done with it? The reason is because existence must abide by the fifth law of existence. Fifth Law of Existence Once all requirements stated within the first four laws of existence have been satisfied, one incontrovertible truth must be established. Existence requires justification. And there it is, folks. The most feared and respected law of existence that humanity would later define as fate, destiny, and divine providence. The evolution of inanimate structure, biological evolution, societal evolution, and even with new inventions, the existence of all must be justified. What is meant by justified is that whatever is subject to the fifth law of existence must demonstrate itself as being necessary or worthy. Here's an example. If we all lived on the surface of Mars, then no product engineer would waste their time inventing a lawnmower. The existence of a lawnmower without the existence of grass is not only unjustifiable, it's just plain stupid. Existence operates by the same principles. If all that existed was a single quark and anti-quark pairing, then their existence would not be justified. There is no benefit associated with their existence. They demonstrate no purpose, nor do they show themselves in any way as being necessary. This is why everything keeps evolving into greater complexity. During every evolutionary event, existence is continuously asking itself, is existence now justified? But sooner or later, existence will run out of new ways to evolve. And if existence cannot honor the fifth law of existence, then there is no necessity for existence and everything becomes irrelevant. Humans represent the most recent stage of existence's evolutionary quest to satisfy the fifth law of existence. We are all individual emissaries of existence sent out to experience, evaluate, and judge everything we encounter with the hope that justification can emerge through our countless value judgments that define the best and worst that existence has to offer. And oh, how we love our opinions to be known, don't we? More about how humanity plays a role in the quest to honor the fifth law of existence can be found in the book titled Zero. Future videos will help to provide clarity for some of the more complex topics. In the meantime, I offer you a collection of candidates that may or may not exist. We can subject each candidate to the five laws of existence to see which ones can exist and which ones can. Our leadoff batter is a square circle. A square circle is a proposed geometric object that has four equal length 90 degree sides with all sides being equally curved to form a single unbroken 360 degree line. We have defined our applicant and have our five laws ready to go. So let's see how far our square circle can make it into the lofty realm of existence. So our first question is, is a square circle logically conceivable as per the first law of existence? Answer, no. True, you could speak the word square circle. You can also offer a definition, but based on its definition, it cannot be actuated. Therefore, a square circle is inconceivable. You'll realize the truth of this the moment you try to draw one. 
With existence being comprised of information, and this information must be conceivable and able to be communicated, our square circle gets summarily eliminated from the onset. Let's move on to another strange candidate. Let's review a 10 cent quarter. A 10 cent quarter is a unit of American currency in the form of a metal coin with an obverse and a reverse. Although one of its properties is defined as having a quarter dollar value, its value is also assessed at 10 cents. Yeah, we see some technical issues early on with this one. So how far can a 10 cent quarter make it within the realm of existence? Well, a 10 cent quarter is logically conceivable, even though its denomination remains in question. You can easily picture holding a 10 cent quarter in your hand along with other US currency. So our 10 cent quarter survives the first round of existential regulations, but can it survive round two? Now a US quarter dollar is defined as having a value of 25 cents, but this particular quarter presents a value of only 10 cents. But this value discrepancy doesn't prevent a 10 cent quarter from moving into existence. Everything that makes up a 10 cent quarter, the metal, the dyes, the mintage, and even the coin's aesthetics can be actualized. So this easily satisfies the second law of existence. Money is defined as valuable, and the more money you possess, the less you have to worry about debt. So within the realm of money, to which our strange coin belongs, debt serves as the antiparticle for money. This satisfies the third law of existence. After all, if there was no such thing as debt, there would be no necessity to pay it off, right? So with debt serving as a satisfactory antiparticle, our 10 cent quarter moves on to the fourth law of existence. A 10 cent quarter easily finds placement within the closed spectrum of US currency. This closed spectrum ranges from the half cent on one end to the $100,000 bill on the other. The spectrum is closed because the US Treasury has stated that it will no longer produce any denominations less than one half cent or any larger than the $100,000 bill. So this closes the spectrum. Unlike our closed quark antiquark spectrum, there's plenty of room for new denominations to pop up somewhere between the two spectrum endpoints. The US Treasury could mint a 15 cent coin or an $11 bill if it desired. So our 10 cent quarter technically survives and moves on to the fifth law of existence. This is where the confusion over the coin's value comes into play. Citizens wouldn't know if the coin was worth 10 cents or 25 cents based on this conflicting definition. Had this 10 cent quarter actually been minted, then it would undoubtedly be rejected due to its confusing value. In other words, its existence is not justified and the fifth law of existence thusly seals its fate for all eternity. Next up to bat, Sasquatch. Sasquatch is a large, hairy, human-like creature believed by many to exist in the Northwest United States and Western Canada. It represents the North American counterpart of the Himalayan region's mythical monster, the abominable snowman, or Yeti, and is sometimes referred to as Skunk Ape, Chewy, or Bigfoot. So does Chewy exist or not? Let's find out. Sasquatch is absolutely conceivable. It's just another big, hairy mammal, so there's no logical barriers negating the existence of our Sasquatch. Chewy easily sails past the first law of existence and straight into the second. Sasquatch is defined as a large, hairy, human-like creature. And existence already has a multitude of creatures matching this description, so the information associated with Sasquatch is readily communicable. An actuated Sasquatch would also represent a typical move from simplicity to complexity in evolutionary terms. So based on these factors, Chewy has satisfied the second law of existence and rightfully moves on to the third. Sasquatch is also defined as a living creature, so it shares the same antiparticle that all other life forms face, which is death. With an acceptable antiparticle being present, our Sasquatch meets the minimum requirement of the third law of existence. Our Sasquatch logically occupies a position somewhere within a parent spectrum called Animalia, which we call a kingdom. So Chewy already has a spectrum for which it can reside. Chewy could also find placement within various subspectrums, such as mammals, apes, herbivores, or predators, depending on its design and function. Whatever the case, Sasquatch has abided by the fourth law of existence by establishing placement within evolvable spectrums. Now all that's left is for Chewy to satisfy the fifth law of existence. As it stands, a Sasquatch is just a highly evolved representation of quarks from the beginning of the universe. True, a living Sasquatch might bring many new constructs and characteristics into existence, but there's no indication that this is the case. Unfortunately for our Sasquatch, it does not represent justification by itself and must work with everything else to satisfy the fifth law of existence. Remember that this does not claim or prove that Sasquatch exists, but rather demonstrates that a Sasquatch actually can exist. The odds for the existence of Sasquatch cannot be set to zero. Batting cleanup is our star candidate called the universe. The universe is defined as all of space and time and their contents, including planets, stars, galaxies, and all other forms of matter and energy. 
the totality of known or supposed objects and phenomena throughout space, the cosmos, macrocosm. The universe is everything. Now, you may argue that the universe obviously exists and to test its capability for existence is, well, silly. But this becomes relevant when addressing later candidates. The idea that there is a single superset containing all things is perfectly conceivable. There are no logical barriers attached to the existence of the universe. So the universe sails past the first law of existence and straight into the second law of existence. All of the information attached to the universe can be actualized, and the end result of that actualization matches the description of everything involved. The universe is also the poster child for demonstrating an evolution from simplicity to complexity, so the universe clearly abides by the second law of existence. As we've already learned, the third law of existence requires an antiparticle for everything seeking existence, and this antiparticle must be equally conceivable. With the universe being defined as everything, then the most logical antiparticle is nothing. But as you might remember from our previous video, nothing is inconceivable. So how does this get reconciled? Fortunately for existence, zero is also part of the universe, and this abstract number has already been mathematically assigned to nothing to render it conceivable, even if it's only a temporary fix. With non-existence serving as a suitable antiparticle for existence, the universe moves on to face the fourth law of existence. The universe and nothing form a two-point spectrum, so the minimum requirement for the fourth law of existence has been satisfied. The only question that remains is whether or not this is a closed or dynamic spectrum. Right now, we have the universe, otherwise known as existence, on one end of the spectrum, and nothing or non-existence on the other. There is no such thing as half-existence or half-non-existence, so our spectrum appears to be closed. The only option is to mimic what the quark-antiquark -quark pairs did and abandon their original spectrums to seek out spectrums that are more able to evolve. Obviously, the nothing side of the spectrum isn't going to find any evolvable spectrums, so it is what it is. But the universe is free to generate as many internal spectrums as conceivability allows. With a multitude of evolvable spectrums peppering the cosmos, the universe easily survives the fourth law of existence. Well, for now. The instant no more evolution can take place, the fifth law of existence steps in to render its judgment. With the universe still moving from simplicity to complexity within countless evolvable spectrums, it is not subject to the fifth law of existence at this time. However, if it were, what judgment would the fifth law of existence decree? Now let's test something purported as being even larger than the universe. Actually, it's infinitely larger, infinitely existing, and a facilitator of all possible worlds. No, it's not what you're probably thinking. So let's put science's latest theory, the multiverse, to the test. The multiverse is defined as a hypothetical group of multiple universes. Together, these universes comprise everything that exists the entirety of space, time, matter, energy, information, and the physical laws and constants that describe them. The different universes within the multiverse are called parallel universes, other universes, alternate universes, or many worlds, and operate in an unending cycle of creation and destruction. Well, since the universe passed with flying colors, the multiverse should perform even better, right? <laughs> Let's see. If the universe is conceivable, then no doubt a bunch of universes, or even an infinite number of universes, is conceivable. There are no logical barriers that prevent the conception of a multiverse, there's just an infinite number of them. So multiverse safely pushes forward to face the second law of existence. The second law of existence requires that all information associated with something must be able to be actuated by way of an evolutionary progression of consciousness, information, moving from simplicity to complexity. This doesn't bode well for our infinitely enormous multiverse. An infinite stream of universes participating in an unending cycle of creation and destruction while having no beginning or end presents some existential problems. By definition, the multiverse cannot move into existence because it has supposedly always been in existence. Likewise, an infinitely regenerating multiverse doesn't move from simplicity to complexity because all possible levels of complexity would have been present all along. My sympathy to the many multiverse proponents currently abandoning this video, but the multiverse gets summarily shut down by the second law of existence. Now let's test something purported as being even bigger than the universe and the multiverse combined. Let's see how God does when facing the five laws of existence. God is defined as an infinitely existing, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnibenevolent creator of all that exist. Having no beginning or end, God is a being that's perfect in power, wisdom, and goodness who is worshipped as a creator and ruler of the universe. A perfect, all-powerful being is readily conceivable. There are no logical barriers preventing the conception of an all-powerful God. So Jehovah easily survives the first law of existence. However, we run into some resistance when it comes to the second law of existence. 
An infinitely existing entity with no beginning or end cannot be brought into existence by way of an evolutionary progression of consciousness, moving from simplicity to complexity. Something that has always existed cannot emerge or evolve from a simpler state. Just like with science's multiverse, theism's omnipotent God gets shut down by the second law of existence. As you subject other items to this test, you'll quickly discover that anything defined as infinitely existing doesn't fare well when facing the five laws of existence. Even an all-powerful being cannot bypass these existential laws. You've probably never heard of our next candidate because I just made it up earlier this morning. Next up in our existence lineup is Matter Gobbler. Now, Matter Gobbler is defined as a self-existing metaphysical entity with no beginning and no end. Matter Gobbler has always existed, yields a 100% successful performance rating, and its purpose in existence is to devour all forms of substance and matter the instant anything pops into existence. It's not difficult to conceive of an entity that consumes matter the instant it emerges. You may have relatives that do the same on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Although Matter Gobbler has a few logical and functionality issues, its description and makeup are absolutely conceivable. Just like munching on some of Lawrence Cross's virtual particles popping in and out of existence can be a satisfying tree, our matter gobbler satisfies the first law of existence. Now, previous candidates that failed to abide by the second law of existence did so because they couldn't be brought into existence through a conscious progression moving from simplicity to complexity. This is a common problem associated with constructs and anything defined as infinitely existing. In this case, matter gobbler is no different. However, matter gobbler has two logical issues. One, Existence cannot logically process something that claims to be infinitely existing, as this means there was no origin point. But Matter Gobbler has another problem. Two, how can Matter Gobbler exist if we exist? Shouldn't Matter Gobbler have gobbled up every particle we're made of before we were ever made? Yet here we are discussing our cosmos-consuming friend called Matter Gobbler. A belief in the existence of Matter Gobbler is rather hard to chew because it miserably fails to abide by the second law of existence. Poor old Matter Gobbler just got placed on an eternal diet of absolute nothingness. Now here's something you might want to have in a pinch. It's a powdered water machine, but this one is a little tricky. A powdered water machine, or PWM, is a mechanical device that condenses H2O, otherwise known as water, into a highly concentrated powder that can be reconstituted back into H2O at a later date. Powdered water is the perfect solution for those long journeys across dry, arid terrain and a definite advantage during times of drought. So let's see if this strange new machine can actually exist. Will it survive the first law of existence? Machines that work with powders and water are readily conceivable. That piping hot cup of joe you're currently drinking probably came from one. So the first law of existence is easily honored. We could let the second law of existence deal with what this machine is purported to do. In fact, let's do that right now. Does our powdered water machine abide by the second law of existence? The answer is a resounding no. Our PWM suffers the same fate as Matter Gobbler, but not the same fate as our 10 cent quarter. Like Matter Gobbler, a PWM cannot be brought into existence through an evolutionary progression of consciousness moving from simplicity to complexity. But the logical barrier is not the machine itself, or Matter Gobbler for that matter. The logical barrier with our PWM and Matter Gobbler is the impossibility of them being able to do what they're supposed to be able to do. The reason why a 10 cent quarter can survive all the way up to the fourth law of existence is because, regardless of the impossibility of establishing a consistent value, the coin can be minted. You can hold one in your hand. It would simply end up as a stupid, senseless coin and another example of out of control government. However, our powdered water machine can't put any powdered water in your hand. And what would you use to reconstitute this powder even if it could? Let's test a trendy subject that everybody's interested in. Extraterrestrials. An extraterrestrial, or commonly referred to as a space alien, is a living being or life form residing outside or originating outside the limits of Earth, also known as a traveler from outer space. Anyone who's watched the movie E.T. and Predator knows that extraterrestrials are perfectly conceivable. No logical barriers are attached to E.T., just because we don't have E.T. engaging in a worldwide podcast doesn't mean they aren't out there. So with logical conceivability fully accounted for, we can move right on to the second law of existence. It is logical to think that an alien species would emerge and develop through an evolutionary process just like we did. E.T. would naturally move from simplicity to complexity just like everything else. So extraterrestrials unquestionably satisfy the second law of existence. Extraterrestrials fall under the category of life, whose most logical antiparticle is death. 
So E.T. shares the same oppositional reference point that humans do when addressing the third law of existence. So with the third law of existence satisfied and no barriers to the second and first laws, E.T. moves on to the fourth law of existence where the establishment of an evolvable spectrum is mandatory. When facing the fourth law of existence, ETs would be considered yet another living species that gets added to an already existing 8.7 million different species. Not to mention how many subspectrums can form within this alien species based on a variety of shapes, sizes, and types. If ETs are out there, then the odds are that they are either facing or have already faced some of the same existential hurdles that we've faced. Humans, animals, insects, extraterrestrials, and all other living things have all been set in motion to satisfy the fifth law of existence. So extraterrestrials are technically riding the same evolutionary train that humans are. But the fifth law of existence looms on the horizon and our destination remains unknown. The worst thing that can happen for both species is that we end up in a closed two-point spectrum that's incapable of evolution. At that point, the fifth law of existence issues a summary judgment. Even without the presence of extraterrestrials, you see humanity unknowingly reducing itself into a two-point closed spectrum with no evolution taking place between the endpoints. Humanity is split straight down the middle on virtually all issues, and there doesn't seem to be any middle ground. Both sides think they are right and believe the other side is not worthy of existence. This is a precursor to the self-annihilation of our species. Time will tell if we can work together to satisfy the fifth law of existence before it's too late. Now let's test your existential knowledge with a brief quiz. Oh, quizzes are so much fun. For this section, I'm going to introduce you to two candidates, define them, and then you can decide if they can or cannot exist based on the five laws of existence. So first up is limited infinity. <laughs> yes, limited infinity is defined as a state, construct, or condition that possesses all of the characteristics of infinity, but is equally limited in its capacity to continuously move forward in time. An example of limited infinity would be all potential positive whole numbers that can exist up to the number 10 to the 10,000th power. That's a big number. Got it? So is limited infinity logically conceivable and satisfies the first law of existence? Touch yes or no on your screen. <laughs> well, I can't tell what you press because YouTube doesn't work that way. But if you touch no, then you would be correct. Although the terms limited and infinity are conceivable, when combined into a single construct, they no longer retain their conceivability. Just like with our square circle, the combination of conflicting definitions renders limited infinity inconceivable. So that wasn't too hard, was it? Well, let's try something a little more difficult. I give to you an anenium. An anenium, also known as Ecofrancium, or element 119, is the hypothetical chemical element with the symbol UUE and atomic number 119. An anenium and UUE are the temporary systematic IUPAC name and symbol, respectively, which are used until the element is discovered, confirmed, and a permanent name is established. So is science wasting its time with something that cannot exist or furthering the evolution of the periodic table? Does an anenium satisfy the first law of existence? If you said yes, then you are correct. A new element with 119 protons and electrons along with 122 neutrons is perfectly conceivable. There are no logical barriers attached to a potential element called an anenium. If you said no, then rewatch this entire video and pay attention this time. So the first law was easy to pass, but what about the second law of existence? Does an anenium still survive? Again, yes is the correct answer. Not only does an anenium abide by the second law of existence, Scientists are currently attempting to synthesize it under laboratory conditions. This is a textbook example of anenium being brought into existence through a progression of consciousness moving from simplicity to complexity. In other words, the information attached to anenium can be physically actuated into anenium simply by logically processing all of the information that defines it. Things you cannot do with matter gobbler, a PWN, or limited infinity. What about the third law of existence? Can anenium form an evolvable spectrum or serve as a member of some other spectrum that does? All right, time's up, and the answer is yes. Anenium necessarily has its own antiparticle, just like all of the other elements. So the third law of existence has thus been satisfied. And using the word antiparticle was my shameless attempt at not having to say anti-anenium. Can anenium form an evolvable spectrum or serve as a member of some other spectrum that does and satisfy the fourth law of existence? Once again, the answer is yes. 
Not only does uninenium find placement in the dynamic spectrum of elements, but it also establishes a new spectrum endpoint by supplanting element 118, which used to occupy the top spot on the spectrum. This means that uninenium survives to face the fifth law of existence. So how would it fare if it did? Does uninenium provide justification for its existence? Does it provide justification for anything? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Element 119 is no different than element 1 when it comes to establishing a justifiable state of existence. In fact, all elements could be wiped from existence and nary a tear would be shed. Now, something far greater than particles, elements, and matter must emerge before the fifth law of existence can be honored. Whether or not that's happened is to be determined. Now we have a bonus round. I've got a new candidate I'm going to introduce to you, and we're going to subject it to the five laws of existence, just like the others. And that is you. Yes, you are an individual member of the species Homo sapiens, which are the most abundant and widespread species of primates. Characterized by the bipedalism and exceptional cognitive skills due to large and complex brain. Which begs the question, can you satisfy the first law of existence? One look in the mirror demonstrates that you do, but if you didn't have access to a mirror, the information that defines you is still logically conceivable. There's nothing inconceivable about you that can negate your existence. Let's see if you satisfy the second law of existence. Well, the information attached to you was brought into existence the moment you were conceived, and you have been consistently evolving from simplicity to complexity from the point of conception. You are the poster child for the second law of existence. But what about the third law? Do you have a corresponding reference point that established conceivability for both? Yes! You actually have numerous reference points because you emerged so late in the game. You are made up of many of the elements depicted in our periodic table which are already abiding by the third law of existence. You are also a card-carrying member of life, so your antiparticle is death. You easily survive the third law of existence and move on to the fourth. So do you abide by the fourth law of existence? Are you firmly positioned in a closed or dynamic spectrum? Absolutely. You belong to the dynamic spectrum of Homo sapiens, which has a multitude of evolution taking place in its spectrum. All the quarks, protons, hydrogen atoms, and everything else that forms you are hitching a ride within you hoping to satisfy the fifth law of existence. So can you do it? Can you satisfy the fifth law of existence? Is there anything about you that justifies your existence, the existence of your species, and everything else that exists? You may not know this, but you represent the latest evolutionary stage of existence's quest to honor the fifth law of existence. You represent the evolution of every quark, proton, particle, and every living cell that orchestrated your existence. Over the past 13.8 billion years, nothing has been able to establish justification for existence. Everything could be whisked away in a heartbeat, nary a tear would be shed. Self-aware humans are existence's last hope for honoring the fifth law of existence, and that's where you come into play. You have no idea what's at stake or the power that you wield. So if you want to know if humanity can actually pull it off, then order the book titled Zero from any of the links listed in the video's description. Thank you once again, and stay tuned for our next video titled What are Spectrums? where we obviously break down everything about spectrums. Note that Zero by One Publishing will never ask you to like our videos or subscribe to this channel. That's completely up to you. 